Hello, Houston. We're just sitting here fiddling with buttons, getting ready for you guys to arrive. Uh, having done so, let me just jump right in here and remind you that we are um, getting close to the time where your independent project probably already should be turned in, just in terms of where we are in the course itself. Our intent will always be to have it graded and returned to you the day of the final. Sometimes it'll be available a day or two earlier if you want to check with the, the course teaching assistant. Uh, he or she will have it in their office. Um, in his or her office uh, beforehand for pickup. But in any case, we had been looking last time at loneliness as, a, um, as an attribute of our, our human existence, uh, and I had covered two among four or five different ways in which loneliness uh, has been studied with remarkably consistent results. Just as a reminder, the McGill studies uh, involve sensory deprivation, where in that case they really went to serious extremes to have people lying in a bed. They had cardboard sleeves on their arms. Uh, they were instructed to lie quietly, and essentially they were simply left alone, um, simply taken to the restroom when they needed to, to go. But other than that, they were simply isolated. Air conditioner covered the noise. Uh, they had um, ping pong ball halves over their eyes so that everything, all they had was just a uniform white field or, you know, black if they turned their head into the into the pillow. Um, and in that case, um, paid the equivalent of $175 a day, they couldn't last very long. Um, some people lasted into the third or fourth day, but the second day was kind of the optimal quit time in that situation. Um, I have never decided what the correct pronunciation is for the next investigator, Sifri or Sifer, I think. Sifer is my bet as to the actual correct pronunciation. He was an investigator in France who isolated himself in a very different way. What he tried to establish was temporal isolation, and he did that, among other things, by putting himself in, in a cave way down into a cave so that there was no hint from the outside as to what time of day it actually was. And what he found was that, that on a natural cycle, you and I tend to drift into about a 25-hour cycle um, day-night uh, in our own head in terms of, of how long we sleep, uh, when we get up, how long we remain active, and, and so forth. Um, and that was the primary con uh, conclusion of, of CIFR. Uh, it was followed then by, by a, um, a different kind of study done by William DeMent at, at Stanford, in which, again, he went for, for essentially isolation, um, not so much uh, physical deprivation or sensory deprivation as simple isolation um, in, in not having any clues directly from the sun. And that was the table, that I, the graph that I kind of rushed through last time. And I wanted to bring it back to let you look at it for a minute and really appreciate what was actually demonstrated here. So in this particular study done by DeMent, um, the tannish, light tannish, first 10 days, as indicated here by the, by the color, um, were where the subject was in a normal situation, a normal day-night uh, situation where the, the rising and falling of the sun could easily, or setting of the sun, could easily be observed. And then these subjects were put into a 25-day period where they were, they were deprived of any isolation uh, of any information regarding the setting of the sun. And there are two things to note that go on here. Um, one is that, it, as you can see, what's depicted here is two running days, that is midnight to noon to midnight, uh, two times over. And what you find is that, that almost immediately after being removed from the sun, we start defining for ourselves a slightly longer day. So the net result is that you're getting, um, your, your cycle is about 25 hours in that situation. It's not quite that, uh, probably closer to 24 and a half hours as I look at it from day 10 to, uh, to day 35. You're shifting over, over 25 days and they've actually drifted 24 hours. Well, it is closer to an hour a day. They've drifted almost an hour late um, in what they expect to occur when. So you can see that when with no cues from the sun, people tend to get up about an hour later, day by day, uh, meaning that we establish essentially a 25-hour cycle for ourselves uh, and then very quickly recover it. I mean, it, it was simply one night um, and the timing was back. That's probably what was achieved by the alarm clock more than anything else. But, but uh, we very quickly readapt to a 24-hour day when we have the cues from the sun. The one other thing that is interesting in that graph that I also wanted to call to your attention uh, is the fact that the triangle, that blob that you can see on each of the lines, is actually the measured low temperature point within the body of the people who are being studied in that situation. And it's, it, 
it is obvious in the first days, uh, the first 10 days of the study, that that low temperature point tends to be somewhere during the, the uh, sleeping hours, tending toward the later end of, of the uh, eight hours or so that we are actually asleep. But notice what happens when we are removed from light cues. What happens is that it tends to, to drift earlier in the day-night cycle or the day cycle that we establish for ourselves. Um, and by about five or six days, by say the 15th uh, day after five in, with no cues to the sun, that low temperature point has drifted to the beginning of the sleep cycle. And essentially it becomes a marker. That's probably what we're responding to, although the subjects were not consciously aware of it, that um, my temperature is, is lower now. I, I should be asleep. I should go to sleep. And so the, the, um, it looks as though the, the body temperature measured um, implicitly is the precipitator of, of six or eight hours of sleep. Um, and then notice it doesn't recover immediately in the bottom part, the, the darker tan, or I don't know what color that's coming across as in, in the television, but the darker area at the bottom of the slide covering the last 10 or 12 days. Um, it takes about four or five days for the, the low point in the temperature to actually start drifting later. And you can see that it is clearly drifting back to where it was at the beginning of the study. Study, and that is uh, toward the, the latter, later in the um, in the sleep cycle itself, in terms of, of when it's going on. But but Demence was a fascinating study in in terms of, of looking at at some of the changes, actually quantifying them, measuring the changes that occur in our sleep cycle when we simply don't have any hints from the um, from the sun itself. Um, Another couple of studies were, were also done of, of similar magnitude, uh, similar intent, I should say. Stanley Schachter um, performed one of these. What he tried to do was the same thing as essentially as DeMent had achieved. Um, and in this case, he used simply five undergraduates who were paid at that time, this is uh, 40 some odd years ago, um, about $50, not about, precisely $50 a day. And they were simply put in a room where they had a lamp, a chair, a bed, a table, and a bathroom, and that's all. And then they were simply left alone so they could take care of their own bodily needs as they, as they needed to. Um, and the results from Schachter's um, attempt were, were quite interesting and, and similar into, in, as to what we found in the, in the previous studies. And that is one, one undergraduate participating quit in the first 20 minutes. 20 minutes of being all alone was not something he was willing to uh, tolerate. Three of them lasted into the second day and one actually lasted for eight days. It was observed by Schachter that when, by the time that, that undergraduate exited the, the experiment, um, he was uh, uneasy and nervous, but otherwise okay. A little bit jumpy, I guess, would be the way we would uh, describe him. But that was a relatively low-key demonstration consistent with the kind of things we've been talking about here. The one that was incredibly devastating was, was um, going after sensory deprivation in a more serious manner, and that is John Lacey. Um, also at McGill, as it turns out, about a year or a year and a half after the original study that was reported out of McGill, um, developed essentially a body temperature water bath. And what he used in that was um, salt, so that what he did was to adjust the concentration of the, of the, the salt balance of, of the water in such a way that he used the salt to adjust the specific gravity uh, or adjust the saltiness of, of the, the water in which subjects were asked to float, so that it specifically, it exactly matched the specific gravity of each individual subject. So the effect of that was that when you, when you were participating in that study, all of your clothes were taken off and you were simply attached to a facial mask um, where um, the, the eyepieces had been painted over so that you had just kind of a, a watercolored uh, neutral color that you could look at, but you know, the lens was so close that you couldn't see any detail out of it. Um, and then you simply hung there. And the, the advantage of, of having adjusted the, the salt balance of the water was such that you literally, you were in a tank that was about six by six by six, roughly. But they had it adjusted so well that in fact you just literally hung. So that although the only face, uh, only support was the mask which was attached to your face, which was in fact attached to an oxygen supply and a rigid support for you. But because you were floating in, in a neutral situation there, um, there was really very little pressure on the mask. It, it was there without significantly pressing on your body to, to deliver, deliver um, oxygen and so forth. And the, the, um, the effects that were achieved there were astounding. That is, it took less than two hours 
for most of the subjects to simply back out of that. They simply couldn't handle it. And the effects that in some cases, um, in Schachter's experiment that took um, as much as eight days to achieve, were achieved in about two hours in Lacey's uh, water tank. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of that is that, that that tank design is actually the basis for the for the kind of water tanks that you can buy for yourselves now, where you put you, you know you submerge yourself in, in a salt water solution and, and essentially it is reported to be very relaxing in that kind of a situation. But what all of these studies very consistently show is that you and I really do require variety of sensory input. That is, it's, it's nice in one sense when you're going to sleep to be in a quiet place where you can kind of just cognitively float freely. But in fact, the interaction that you and I have is really very effective in keeping us grounded and in contact with the world in, in such a way that we can observe it significantly in, in terms of you know, what's happening and how best to react to it. But the, um, the, the, um, we need that variable or incoming stimulation, and, and yet some uh, do seek isolation. Others will, will find that quite exhilarating or stimulating or conducive even to religious experiences and so forth. But whether you're an explorer or an artist or, or a mystic, we may all seek to be alone in, in certain situations and for very different reasons. But extended isolation can be very disturbing to any of us, essentially. Being alone is simply not the same as being lonely. And I want to make that distinction for you. Aloneness is an objective state. Um, any of us can assess it. You're alone or you're with other people. But loneliness is essentially a subjective state for which uh, each of us is, is the only judge as to the impact that it actually has. We can measure it in various ways from the outside, but loneliness is really an internal state as it's being described. And so it, it essentially involves um, several different elements in order to, to qualify as true loneliness as we're talking about it here. Listed on the screen are the factors such as uh, it being a subjective experience um, which cannot be measured by others. It, it, that's ultimately an internal experience that you and I have and we have to report outward if the rest of us are to get any feeling as, as to what's involved in the subjective experience of loneliness. It generally results from some deficiencies in a person's social relationships. We're going to talk some about that over the next uh, hour or so. And it is also reported, in general, to be unpleasant. Loneliness is not a state that you and I, for the most part, actively tend to seek, unless we need to sit down and crank out a term paper under time pressures. Then it's a matter of leave us alone. Um, but in general, uh, it's not something that we, that we it's, it's unpleasant enough that we don't normally tend to seek it ourselves. But if we try to describe what we mean by loneliness, um, there are several common elements that tend to show up. Uh, Rubenstein and Shaver uh, in the early 80s asked subjects to basically describe feelings that they experienced when they were lonely, when, when they were feeling lonely. And there were four items that tended to show up across a wide variety of the descriptions that they collected. One of these was essentially a, a feeling of, of desperation, that is, of being panicked and helpless in terms of the loneliness that they felt. That might happen to you out on a highway at, at night when you have a flat. That would be one case where loneliness might strike pretty, pretty directly in our, our everyday lives. A second element is, is depression. That's another feature that tends to show up in people's description um, of, of what they experience when they are lonely. Thirdly, uh, and you will be able to identify this, what often shows up is an expression called impatient boredom. Um, and I can give you a very specific example for you of that which will, will ring, resonate within you very easily. And that is, do you remember how bored you were, how totally bored when you were in fifth grade and it was raining? An elementary school kid at home during a rainstorm is kind of the epitome of loneliness. Uh, it's just, you know, you've got this magnificent bedroom of toys and activities and so forth. Nothing works. When, when it's raining and you can't get to a friend's house, boredom and, and loneliness are going to be the, the results in that situation. And that tends to show up in our, our general description of many people's description of, of what's involved by, by loneliness. But I, I like the way in which uh, the investigators in, uh, labeled it, and that was essentially impatient boredom. And I can distinctly remember times in my childhood when that was the case. My nearest friend was about a block and a half away and moms, of course, didn't allow kids out in the rain, so I was stuck at home in those situations. And it was a real high point in that kind of boring experience to have someone come visit you in that situation. And the final element that also tends to be reported many times is self-deprecation. 
That is, it's, it's somehow we tend to heap it on ourselves that in fact the loneliness is our fault or, or our problem, and in some ways it is. Um, but the, the things like rain for, for a youngster is something that we just don't control directly, so in some ways the self-deprecation is, is heaping more abuse on ourselves than we really ought to intellectually. But it results essentially from a frustration of the need to affiliate. Uh, and I can give you several examples of that. It, it, um, Christmas time can be a very stressing time for older people. Surprisingly enough, um, they, they may be included in family activities um, built around Christmas, but of course Christmas is primarily focused on children. That's, that's the, the major purpose of the, of the party atmosphere that we've built up over the years as, as, a, as a society built around Christmas. But as we become older, uh, the oldest surviving members of families um, oftentimes simply are not privy to the, the magic of that, that particular holiday event. And, and you really could describe it as magic from the, the perspective of kids because all of a sudden, you know, gifts arrive that they hadn't um, anticipated and uh, expected and, and so forth and so on. Part of the, the myth we built around, around Santa Claus itself. But certainly for older folks, they simply are never going to be able to, to look forward again to sitting on someone's knee and having a, a story like the Christmas story um, or the night before Christmas read to them by a, a loved grandmother or grandfather or anything like that. That is simply an experience that is beyond uh, the the uh, possibilities for an older person, and as we age, the 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 finality of that kind of an observation becomes even more obvious. But as we look at that overall, there are two types of loneliness that tend to exist. One of these is is described as as what is known as emotional loneliness, um, and in this case, what we're talking about is is uh, its cause. Whoops, I didn't mean to jump that far yet. Pardon my fumbleness here, um, but it's caused by a lack of close, intimate attachment to one particular person. Examples would include um, the recently divorced or someone who's recently been widowed or widowered. I guess that's the other technical word that's applied there. That tends to lead to emotional loneliness. Um, that is something that you can work yourself out of, but, but typically it doesn't happen easily. That's, that's a months-long project to, to correct that kind of, of um, emotional loneliness, one of two types. Um, a second type Type is, is essentially social loneliness, which can be caused by the absence, you know, maybe somebody's out on a trip or something, but the absence of friends or relatives or the absence of, of a social network encouraging uh, shared interests and activities and so forth. Usually we are about the business, we humans are about the business of building ourselves a social network. We find other people who share the interests that we have, who like the activities that we're engaged in, and that creates things like sailing clubs and hunting clubs and chess match clubs and so forth and so on, just appealing, collecting people together who share a common interest, which provides a, an unchallenged automatic kind of basis for interacting. Um, and the solutions then to, the, to these kind of problems are as, are as diverse as, as the, the causes of loneliness itself. Um, and and the, the negative reactions that, that loneliness tends to engender are things like increased passivity. That's one thing we tend to find among the lonely. They tend to sit rather than working actively when they are alone to, to correct the situation. Crying, sleeping, either of those can, will often be reported by people who experience significant loneliness, uh, whether it's of the emotional or the social type. Um, drinking is another possibility, uh, or certainly taking tranquilizers, or for that matter, even other types of drugs. There is some evidence of that among those who are lonely. Um, or even long-term aimless television watching. Turn the set on and somehow that's going to provide activity, uh, interaction into your, um, into your environment. The difficulty, of course, is that that's a one-way feed. I mean, whatever may be going on on the television, in the worst case, you may end up watching a family uh, in rich kind of family interactions. And in some ways that isolates you even further as you're watching that set, you're simply reminded by everything on the screen that here you are sitting alone just watching the, the television. Interestingly enough, men and women experience loneliness about equally. And yet women are more likely to call themselves lonely in a given situation. There, there may be some sex stereotyping involved there because men are, are uh, uh, envisioned in some ways as being strong, not supposed to acknowledge things like being lonely. And yet men and women experience loneliness about equally in, in proportion. Um, and the frequency with which um, loneliness occurs also tends to vary in, in a variety of ways. Um, trait or chronic loneliness um, is essentially a stable pattern of being lonely. 
It's especially likely to occur in people who have, for instance, low self-esteem. Somebody without high self-esteem is very subject to, to uh, chronic loneliness as, as one possibility. Uh, they will tend to exhibit a, a lack of intimate self-disclosure and close friendships. The, the, the people who are saddled with trait or chronic loneliness tend to, to kind of be cloistered with their individual opinions. They don't tend to share easily with other people um, what they value, what they like, what they dislike, and so forth and so on. And then the net result is it becomes a kind of a perpetuating uh, self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of, of loneliness. Chronic loneliness generates the symptoms that keep it as a steady state um, situation that, that may occur. It essentially perpetuates itself, which is a problem in terms of how we try to get out of uh, the feeling of loneliness. The second kind of thing that we have is, oh, I forgot I'd offered you such a nice sexy definition of it, but essentially trait loneliness is a stable pattern of being lonely. I pretty well described that quite elegantly. Secondly, we can talk about it as a state, a, a transitional state of loneliness, and in that case we describe it as, as uh, what is typically uh, a brief temporary period in which loneliness is experienced. This often results, for instance, from dramatic changes in life as you know it, that is in your, your normal form of life, whatever that may be. Um, I know in my own life of many years, the, the single most disruptive event that I go through with any degree of, of regularity, and thankfully not much later, is moving. Uh, moving itself, particularly if you're moving a family and a house and everything else, disrupts everything. Whatever social group you've been in in the city you're leaving is, is totally gone. I mean, it's destroyed when you move away, at least from your own benefits, uh, for your own benefits from it. Um, and the result is that you're, you're in, you put yourself into a, a state or transitional phase of, of loneliness. And for a certain period of time, until you build contacts in the new city, you're going to be lonely. There's simply no friends to share problems with and, and so forth and so on. Um, so those dramatic changes tend to produce that kind of, of uh, transitional loneliness. Um, it often occurs, for instance, when students enter college away from home. Um, the um, in watching myself adapt to the University of Rochester, because that was about 200 miles from where my parents were living in Schenectady at the time I entered, um, and watching other people adopt in the group that we were part of, and, and then having watched over many years as an educator, kids adapting to uh, school, the single most valuable piece of advice that I would give you is that the worst thing you can do if you're in a dorm is stay in your room. The first two weeks you ought to be out at every possible opportunity. Get out of your room and get involved with something. It may just be sitting over at the union talking to people. But that's the single best way to get yourself out of transitional loneliness. If you've moved into a new environment, you've got to figure that a lot of other people have moved in under exactly similar, similar circumstances. Every single member of our entering our FTIC, our first time in college entering class each year, uh, is experiencing some variation of that amount of, of loneliness. But it's transitional. And the easiest way to, to correct it is to reach out. Uh, because there are others who are, who are also interested, share exactly the same experience that you do. Uh, and that transitional loneliness or sensed transitional loneliness will typically disappear as your social network blossoms, as, as a, a new social network begins to develop. And then the third type of, of uh, essentially time-related um, um, loneliness is what's called transient loneliness. And that is essentially, a, that might occur, this is really very short term, but that could occur even when you enter a party. Even if it happens to be among people you know, you understand that all of us, when we're in a party situation, tend to gather with friends. We tend to cluster in interest groups, whether it's the baseball group or, or the, uh, the softball group or the women's soccer group, you name it. Um, we tend to cluster around common interests in, in when we're in a party, uh, partly because we have things that we can share with other people in that we're, we're even-footed in terms of being able to interact in terms of the specific exchange that's going on. But there is that very brief moment two, three, four minutes when you walk into a party where if a host or hostess is good, what they're going to do is collar you by your elbow and take you right over to the bar uh, and get a drink mixed for you and get it in your hand uh, and then introduce you to one of their friends, which often isn't helpful because you may not be, uh, you may not share the interest with that person that you do with other people that you've seen are in attendance in the group. So transient loneliness is not really something we have to carry around on our backs as, as something we need to avoid, but it happens to all of us in various situations. It is usually uh, self-correcting. You and I carry the means by which to, to start that, fix that. All you 
gift is start a conversation. Um, but there is that very brief interval when you walk into a party as, oh, where, where am I going to hook myself in here today? As, as an example of transient loneliness. Basically, there are, there are a number of different bases for, for the way in which we categorize loneliness. And, and the one I've described for you here uh, is essentially um, time-based. I mean, it's obviously time-based in terms of, of length of, of uh, evidence or, or the permanence of, of the states that I've described there. But uh, in other cases, um, time is not the only basis on which we can, we can do this kind of classification. For instance, another thing you might look at is, is the situation, the place in which loneliness occurs to you. Uh, it may not happen at work. You, you know, in order to have a job, most of us have relatively interactive processes. Few of us are, are saddled with, tied to a particular machine where we are contributing to an ongoing process um, that really is critically dependent on us putting a particular nut into a particular, uh, onto a particular bolt and tightening it or whatever. Um, but that is a kind of isolation in, in some ways. In that case, the place, the environment is creating the isolation, but it still leads to longings for greater contact with, with family, with romantic partner, with the community. Any of those can, can be created by, by um, um, place-based isolations in, in this kind of a situation. So how do we attribute this? How do, how do we demonstrate or, or attribute the cause of loneliness? And there are probably two major ways in which that tends to be split. One is to talk about internal attributions. These are, are basically dispositional. Um, and it, these are the people, people for whom loneliness is an internal attribute tend to be the more stably, predictably lonely. That is, these are the people who are simply, if, if they are lonely because of, of internal states, their general disposition, they tend to remain lonely, uh, simply because the, the uh, incentive to get out and meet people is simply not there for whatever reason. They may have been uh, embarrassed or shunned earlier, and, and that's resulted in the loneliness. It's hard to say, but the net result is that it, it's essentially internally caused. And on the other hand, um, what we may do in, in this kind of a situation is to also demonstrate what is called situational loneliness. I'm kind of cutting these in a different way than the previous um, categories that I've, I've suggested to you. But uh, in this case, then, what, what you really need to do is, is, to, um, is to establish meaningful relationship. Let me, I've jumped ahead of myself here. The situational attributes essentially um, occur, especially if loneliness is viewed as a, uh, as a temporary state. It lowers the likelihood of long-term uh, unhappiness. But if your view of it is that it's, it's, it's the circumstances I'm in, uh, a freshman newly entering a college dorm can very easily justify the fact that he doesn't have anybody to talk to that night because it's the first night on campus and, and you know, he hasn't met anybody yet. So, so situational attribution of, of the cause is, is a, it may be a bit of a defensive reaction on the part of us, but it, it also suggests its own solution. That is, if the situation has isolated you, you need to break through the situation and get out into the environment that you now find yourself in. So the best response for, for eliminating the the difficulty is to do several things. First of all, analyze the source of, of, the, uh, of the, the loneliness that you're experiencing. What is actually causing the loneliness as, as I've described it in several different ways above? What's the source of, of, the, um, of the difficulty? Having analyzed it then, what you have to do is to establish meaningful relationships with what are often new friends. Uh, but any of us can easily become a friend to, to another person. Um, and the presence of friends, not parents, not romantic partners, just friends specifically, uh, is the best predictor uh, of college students who are not lonely. The more friends you tend to have, the less likely it is that you're going to find yourself sitting alone in your room feeling lonely in that situation. Contrary to popular belief, um, increasing age leads to decreasing loneliness rather than increasing loneliness. It's sometimes envisioned that, that we, um, the older we get, the more lonely we become. That was kind of implied by the family description I was talking about. Well, what I was really dealing with there was the, the lack of certain kinds of events in, in, in which an older person can get him or herself involved. Uh, they just don't have the experience of sitting on someone's knee having the Christmas story read to them uh, at the holiday season. There, there are reasons for that. Um, but the third is, is that the, um, the, the, um, the, a third way to eliminate the loneliness is simply to make a consistent effort to increase the networks that we experience. And that's one thing that tends to happen as we age. Um, 
you combine that with, with not only the, the, the tendency of most of us to increase our social networks and success in doing so as we age, um, but if you combine that with adolescents and young, adulthood, young adults who are, who are basically searching for or working to establish those social networks, there are a lot of potential sources for all of us um, in, in the broader social environment to establish those networks and nurture them in, in, a, um, in a given way. And so basically one kind of interesting study that was done looked at um, the number of people who reported loneliness in, in a, a particular survey and the results were, were somewhat surprising as you, as you look at what was actually uh, discovered in, in this particular situation. And here are the results that we actually found in, in this particular survey, not me specifically, but psychologists. Um, and that is that in general, uh, people who are, are under 18 um, are about four out of five likely to report having experienced or being lonely at any given time when they are um, when they are uh, polled on on the subject. But that steadily declines to about half as many by the time you're in your mid fifties or older. There's a very clear trend for you and I to get get plugged in with people. We find friends, we form social networks, and so forth. And that is ultimately the best way to avoid loneliness as an end state in in uh, the development of your of your life. Um, which in turn leads into uh, another, that I was surprised when I saw that data. I'd, I'd made quite a different prediction as, as some of you probably had when I raised, when I raised the subject. Um, but in fact, it's quite clear that the, the number of, per, the proportion of us reporting loneliness decreases as we, um, as we age. And that leads directly into one of the more fundamental causes of loneliness, um, and that is simply shyness. Um, which really is an important impediment to, to developing relationships, and that is if you are shy, it's very difficult to get over that hurdle uh, and work specifically toward, toward uh, founding a, a kind of a personal relationship. One of the people who has done the most interesting studies of, of this activity, uh, or this lack of activity in some ways, this attribute, is Phil Zimbardo at Stanford. Uh, who's done a number of, he was author of the prison study uh, somewhat earlier and he's, he's had a number of different impacts um, on, the, the, um, on psychology as a whole. But he was the lead figure uh, in a, a, a lengthy series of studies that he's conducted over the last 20 or 25 years that deal specifically with shyness as a, as a particular attribute. Um, and and uh, we're going to define that for, for our purposes here as the, the experience of, of discomfort, the experiencing of discomfort, inhibition, and or excessive cautiousness in interpersonal interactions. That is such a wordy definition for a state that we all understand. But that's what it basically boils down to is, is simply um, the discomfort that some people feel uh, in, in um, a sense of inhibition. Oh, I really can't or I shouldn't or I, I oughtn't. You know, you can name it in a lot of different ways. But it basically boils down to shyness in that particular situation. Uh, and the net result is uh, some considerable impediment to our, our inclination to want to join or, or uh, correct the, the loneliness that we're experiencing. So we can credit our, our own shyness in, in a certain way. And Zimbardo has asked a lot of different questions about, um, about shyness and, and posed it to, to uh, particularly to undergraduates at Stanford, uh, who are, as a whole, a very high ability group, probably the group you might least expect to experience shyness. And the data that Zimbardo found in this was, was rather interesting, because what he did was to ask um, some fundamental questions about, what are, okay, what's the source of shyness? What causes us to be shy? What elicits shy responses from us? And he found um, in, in looking at all the different surveys he did that one of the major sources is people. And so then he started looking at, well, okay, then how are we going to categorize people in terms of how they interact with other people? And that, that uh, gives us, I mean, you might generate some other ways, in which case you could find yourself a master's thesis out of this kind of a, a question. But in essence, what he did was to look specifically at uh, asking um, undergraduates questions like, how shy do you tend to be or do you experience shyness when you're in the presence of strangers? Um, and the data that he found for, for um, um, those who declared themselves to be shy is as we see here. Um, among shy students, sh strangers are the largest single source of the feeling of, oh, I better not interact with that person, or I don't want to, or I can't, or I shouldn't, whatever. Uh, it, it, it inhibits interaction. Members of the opposite sex is a slightly lower proportion, but it is still a very significant factor in, in people being shy to approach members of the opposite sex. 
Um, Another rather surprising one is knowledgeable authorities. I, in my uh, introduction to psychology course, we have a speaker fee that's attached to it um, that the students pay before they even come into the class, which, which creates a fund for us so that the, the class and I can decide who, ultim who ultimately we want to invite to come talk to us. And so we pay nationally prominent uh, authorities. In fact, Dr. Zimbardo has been here three times at various times as a guest of my uh, introductory psychology students. Um, and yet what I find is that when you have somebody whose national reputation Reputation, international reputation for that matter, is as eminent as, as uh, Phil Zimbardo's, uh, students sometimes just kind of naturally tend to shy away uh, and they don't want to stand around and talk to him or go to lunch or, or supper with him and yet you find that, that um, particularly as people get higher up in, in, uh, in national or international reputation, I would observe over the years of having sponsored many speakers that in a sense the broader the reputation of the person is, the easier it is to interact with them. They tend to just be naturally outgoing given that they're so prominent in whatever field they happen to be a part of. Um, my first wife's um, father was a uh, Nobel laureate in physics and he was an internationally known authority. He was the, one of the easiest going people I ever met, ever interacted with. So just because they're, they're authorities in a given area doesn't immediately lead us to predict that they're going to be grouches or difficult to interact with. Quite the contrary. They're usually very good not only at opening conversations with you, but in fact at carrying them. So the, the, um, the, the fear of the shyness with respect to knowledgeable authorities uh, is kind of uh, misguided, I would argue, in, in terms of my own observations of what tends to go on. Um, position authorities is another example. Certainly you're the assistant principal or associate principal in your high school who was the, the uh, rules enforcer would tend to encourage that kind of an approach, you know, that I am the feared person and, and you need to obey our rules and so forth and so on. Some are a little misguided in using that kind of pressure. But, but there is some reason why people who are in authority, positions of authority sometimes will create shyness just by virtue of the position, not even of the individual who's involved. Relatives, surprisingly enough, can be the elicitors of, of shyness. Elderly people themselves, somehow we, we convince ourselves that that person knows so much more than I do, I really am kind of embarrassed to interact with them. Uh, friends, in some cases, it, it's kind of strange that you know shyness is, is an impediment to social interaction, and yet when you're in the, in the midst of, of people who are your friends, who you're most likely to be able to comfortably interact with, about 11% of us still report being shy in that situation. Children can also be a source of shyness and, and there, you could think of a couple of different reasons why that might occur because you never know what's going to come out of the mouth of a child. They may look at you because you've spilled ketchup on your, on your shorts or something and, and uh, write out loud, you know, why is there a red spot on your shorts and so forth. So, so they can potentially cause problems but, but uh, we clearly categorize them as, as a group to avoid and surprisingly enough even parents um, in some cases elicit shyness on, on our part. Um, the other question that he asked uh, rather interestingly in terms of, of the sources of shyness was, was to look at it not only in terms of, okay, so people can cause it and different categories of people elicit different amounts of shyness from, from those who are shy. What he also did was to look at what are the places, what are the situations where you're most likely to experience shyness and, and um, um, what he generated was, was um, a lot of different situations, experiences where you're likely to run into other, other numbers of people who will elicit particular shyness here. Um, and what he found was that the, the um, I, well I should back up a little bit, I don't know whether I've given you before uh, and I don't remember where it appears in the lectures, but it is the case that uh, if you look at the fears that people list, the highest consistently ranked fears among all Americans is a fear of getting up and talking in front of strangers. Uh, simply having to get up at the PTA meeting and give a report on, on brownie sales or whatever's involved in the, in the situation elicits more fear on the part of more Americans than, than any other single event. So it is clearly a, a shyness related, uh, that is shyness is one of the factors that, that makes that such a high source of anxiety. But in any case, when you look at the, the situations where shyness tends to manifest itself, the graph or, or the table will show you the kind of things that are involved here. What I'm going to list here um, is, the, is the specific ratings that are attached there and what you find is, is that, um, sorry the graph is the, the 
there's so much data to put on there that it's a little smaller than I like to put on the screen normally. But, but when you're the focus of attention in a large group, that is one of the maximum elicitors of shyness. That's the situation that elicits the largest number of reports of, of shyness. Simply being in a large group, even if you're not the, the focal point of that group, still elicits major amounts of, of shyness. Um, when you're in, a, in any group situation where you're in lower status, and it doesn't even have to be a group, that's, that's one of the factors that contributes to, to uh, students' sometimes shyness about interacting with, with a visitor that they have by class vote invited in to, to talk to the classes. It's, it's simply the case that uh, as a student, uh, we tend to feel inferior to uh, particularly acknowledged experts in various kinds of, of situations. That's why I think the, the student government efforts and, and various student group efforts around campus here to bring in national and international experts at various times is a, a first-rate way to deal with problems like shyness. Put people into situations where they can work through those issues and understand that people are experts because they're good at presenting a particular point of view and shyness is not the way to encourage that kind of exchange. Social situations in general may elicit shyness and in the same way new situations, whether they're social or not, also tend to elicit shyness uh, with about an equal degree of magnitude as well as uh, an environment into which you put yourself where you're going to have to act assertively. You've got a particular point of view that you want to have reflected um, in, in a given situation and, and assertiveness is the only way it's going to happen. You're going to have to raise the issue, you're going to have to defend it, you're going to have to potentially even campaign for it to actively convince people that this is is what we ought to do in a given situation. Um, Any time where you're being evaluated is another source of, of potential danger, and there is some natural danger, I mean, in terms of simply acting shy. There's a case where, where it is greatly to our advantage to act as apt as possible, act as apt as possible, uh, and yet we tend to get shy particularly where somebody's about to make a decision about hiring us or, or uh, putting us on a particular project or something. That will also elicit shyness. Even being the focus of attention in smaller groups is anxiety provoking, but only about two thirds as many people report that kind of a difficulty as the difficulties we face in, in, uh, in larger groups. Social situations can, be, can elicit shyness. One-on-one, -on -one, um, one-to-one relationships, particularly with members of the opposite sex, uh, are a major difficulty. Um, and it's interesting, compare that number four listing from the bottom uh, where one-to-one -one interaction with the opposite sex makes almost half of those who report shyness experience shyness. Compare that to one-on-one -on -one interaction with same sex. Um, it's, it's, less than a, it's, about, it's less than a third as many people are, are challenged by same-sex interactions. Um, if you have to go solicit help, another major source of, of shyness, and finally then small task-oriented groups where in some way you're, you're in that group simply because you have expertise in a given area and you're going to be expected to contribute to that, that group interaction. That can also produce uh, situations of, of major shyness in, in this kind of a situation. One of the things I want to point out to you, and I'm kind of summarizing a 200-page book that uh, Dr. Zimbardo has, has created. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but if you look at the overall situations that have shown up here, um, the major sources of shyness as a whole are one of two. It's either people um, or it's places. And so when you analyze the, the, um, the, the bases on which shyness is, is caused, it tends to either be based on, on, um, on the people with whom you're interacting or the places on which you interact. But if you look at the last, if you combine the last two graphs and look at them, by far, places are the major problem for us. That is, for people who are shy, it is the situations in which we, we are forced to participate that causes the greater amount of shyness than necessarily the people with whom we're interacting in a given situation. So the situations are what you really need to analyze. And interestingly enough, you and I control that. We may or may not control who's in a particular situation or how many people are there. Um, but whether we're in that situation or not is, is really up to us. Uh, we choose which kind of a situation we wish to interact in. And therein lies one of the keys to how we get over, uh, handle the problem of shyness. There is, uh, Phil Zimbardo has written a really exquisite book on, on the overall process. He's basically summarized uh, research basically founded predominantly on surveys of undergraduates. So for, for people in college, this is an ideal book because it's built around people who are in college. And the book is entitled, it's a paperback, but it runs about 200 pages. Um, and it's still widely available. It's been a very popular book over the years. And it's called simply 
uh, 1990, Zimbardo's book, and it's called simply Shyness. Okay, what it is, what to do about it. You can't think of a more direct title. I mean, it addresses the problem and offers you help in getting through it. Um, and in fact, he recommends, Zimbardo recommends in that book, recommends three steps that you go through, and you're going to see some similarity to the ways in which we've looked at the problem here earlier. But summarizing his research across uh, thousands of undergraduates, he recommends a three-step process in which you, you try to eliminate um, the problems of, of shyness. One is that you simply analyze the situation. Analyze your shyness, I mean, is, is what I should have said there. Um, and, and you systematically identify the situations that cause you trouble. Where is it that you experience that shyness if you're trying to get away from it? Some people are perfectly happy with shyness. But if you're trying to get away for it, with, from it, um, alter it. Look at the situations that, where you tend to have the greatest difficulties and analyze what it is about those situations that cause the difficulty and then pose to yourself the problem. Can I alter those difficulties, those sources of difficulty? in that situation. The second thing you do uh, in order to, to get around the issues of shyness has to do with the fact that you build self-esteem. Zimbardo's book on shyness actually includes some 15 different steps as to how to build your own self-esteem, your own self-view, try to bring it up to what other people actually think about you. Um, White and Lloyd, Dunn and Hammer, our own course text, um, identifies steps to achieve this in, in chapter five of the book. They list a number of different steps, similar in, in target, in, in intent, to the, the 15 that, that are the subject of the main part of, of Zimbardo's book on, on shyness itself. But you need to develop some strategies to build your own sense of self-worth, self-esteem, valuing yourself. It's very hard to act other than shy if you don't have a real good self-image. Uh, so you need to work on building that self-image. Start internally to correct the problem. And then thirdly, what you need to do is to improve your social skills. Get yourself out into party situations. One possibility, for instance, if, if uh, social skills are a shortcoming of yours, is to put yourself into environments where People are, are equal footed in terms of, of uh, rank. I'm thinking here of, of volunteering activities. Uh, there are various things that go on, uh, charity uh, drives, food drives. Um, Meals on Wheels tends to involve older people simply because there's a lot of driving of, of food and so forth and so on. Uh, but that kind of a, a volunteer effort is, is one way in which you can practice your social skills. You put yourself into a group where you're an equal among other volunteers um, and nobody's uh, going to lord it over you, over you with power positions in that kind of a situation. It's a very effective way to practice, practice improving your social skills. Try interacting with people in different ways. See what works for you. Hard to know what it'll be. Um, it might even be as simple as wearing a button that's unusual. Um, I mean, if you have an interest, but suppose you belong to the National Forest Service or, or uh, um, forest-oriented groups, something like that. Not everybody's going to be interested in talking about that, but somebody who sees the logo of that service is more likely to interact with you. Uh, there are various pins that, that sororities and fraternities give you uh, that will in some cases form instant contacts for you. Uh, when they see the, the particular group's logo, they will approach you. Uh, different groups in, in the um, university or sailing group and so forth um, have pins identifying you as a member of that. Maybe a t-shirt would work or, or a, um, um, a sweatshirt or something like that. A lot of different ways to basically break the ice and, and get something started so you can in fact practice those social skills. But that's a third element that really is, is uh, involved in consistent advice about how to deal with the problem of shyness. From there, we launch into another very interesting uh, category, and that is essentially who do you like and why? Uh, and there turn out to be a lot of cultural differences. In, in the answer that, that each of us would provide individually here. Love is certainly not the same in every culture. It isn't even remotely the same in different cultures. So we experience, we humans experience love in, in a number of different ways. Um, clearly, the, the underlying force here is simply that if men didn't find women attractive and if human women didn't find human men attractive, our species would simply have a lot of trouble surviving because that attraction is ultimately fundamental to the production of the next generation. Um, but what that leads into is an analysis of what it is that you look for in, in
and ultimately in, in mates. Not that all of us are right out on the street looking for a mate immediately every time we strike up a new friendship, but, but that, is, that is an underlying continuity in, in human existence. Um, and when you look at what women as opposed to men and men as opposed to women look for, it turns out there are two major groups on the field uh, of social interaction, and they have different goals, basically. Uh, women are, are basically looking for resource acquisition. I'm dealing here with a worldwide summary, so don't take personal offense at this either way, uh, because it's going to be equally offending for men, because what I'm going to argue is that the data suggests that women, men, seek reproductive capacity. Okay, Youth, health, and attractiveness are three major factors that we tend to, um, that we tend to, to um, value as men in looking for, for women to date, to interact with, and so forth. But you have to put that in the broader social context out of which we come. There is some logic behind why those two statements are generally true and can be documented research-wise. And that is the fact that, as we've talked previously in, in the class here, women worldwide are ultimately the family raisers. They are the ones who are left with the end product of, of uh, sexual intercourse. Uh, and is their, their selected or assigned, it's hard to say, responsibility ultimately to raise children. And their social skills are, are tuned to doing that. Um, men, on the other hand, are traditionally the ones who are, are in the fields uh, doing the farming and so forth. This country is a really interesting sociological experiment right now because over, you know, given the laws that we have created about equality and the gradual way in which we've kind of eased into, we've pursued the ultimate implications of those laws, it is quite clear that what our society is founded on is the premise that both men and women deserve equal shots at this, that, and the other job. And that ultimately leads to um, the fact that, that um, you can see it in, in our society now. Um, over half of the women, let me back up a little bit, in over half of the families uh, defined as married couples or, or permanently related couples, uh, in, the, in those situations, family situations, over half the women now have jobs. And that we've only reached that point in the last 15 years or so, and that's the first time in the history of our country and I dare say in the history of any country in the world where that situation has been, has been established during peacetime. In war, it may happen simply because um, uh, the men are traditionally the ones that are drafted and, and go off to kill each other, although that's increasingly happening also with women where you're given the opportunity to be drafted. Um, but the net result is that the women remain in a power position in terms of having, having to be in an empowered position to defend their family and to feed them, to, to provide the food during, during the time when the, the, um, the wage earner is, is not, not there. Uh, and so our society, having nat naturally moved into the situation where half of the women, uh, more than half the women, are out of the home, has really posed an interesting sociological explanation, first of all, as to whether it's going to work. Is the, are, are those changes in law and therefore in opportunity going to also be impacted in, in changes in the social responsibility of, of traditionally assigned to women as opposed to men in the married situation? There is increasing evidence that we find, for instance, uh, stay-at-home dads as opposed to stay-at-home moms. There is, there is growing evidence that that kind of thing is happening. So the, the, um, it's an interesting time to be alive to observe social interaction in general um, in terms of what may be going on. But, but regardless of these kind of seeking opportunities, it is the case that, that uh, love is ultimately very much a product of the culture in which it's being expressed or not expressed, as the case may be. Uh, the acts of falling in love by boy and girl are played out in a cultural context um, the best way to illustrate that is the fact that uh, in, in the first version of the course, I interviewed a, a member of our psych faculty who at the time I interviewed her was, was very close to retirement. That's the most diplomatic way to say it. But she actually sat at, at the desk here and interacted with me uh, about what it was like to be dating in Galveston in about 1910. I mean, it was just, it was a completely different world at that time. People didn't have cars. Uh, there was, of course, no seawall. There were a lot of different dangers in that. But the, the, the event that I will always remember her describing was the fact that given the way uh, adolescents and, and young adults date now, it is simply the case. You get in the car and you drive to a restaurant or a movie or a play or an athletic event, you name it. But it is the case that you 
go away from your normal living establishment. You and that partner, selected short-term partner, go somewhere else. And what she was reporting was that when she was dating uh, as an, at an adolescent in Galveston, they would walk the beach. That was one of the, the prime um, activities, but it was always directly under the supervision of parents. That is, if they simply walked down the street, given that air conditioning was not prominent in Galveston at the time, all the porches opened out toward the ocean, which normally what they were relying on was the ocean breeze. I mean, that was the way in which you kept cool in Galveston um, essentially 100 years ago now. Uh, and it was just fascinating as, as you kind of contemplate that dating for her was entirely a social event and much more family oriented simply by virtue of the environment in which she grew up. You were never out of sight of your parents um, and therefore there was a, a lot more um, um, sensitivity to social properness in that kind of a, situ in that kind of a situation. Um, it is interesting to compare that notion of, of love and the idea that we develop love before getting married, and that's certainly very much a Western tradition. Uh, by contrast, for instance, in India, it is the case that you have what are called arranged marriages. The, the typical marriage in India today is still arranged. Um, they're, they're essentially completed through a process of negotiation between the families that are involved where the love existing between the two, two uh, people is simply not an issue. It's not involved. The exchange is strictly a, a property issue and a, a physical resource, a monetary issue that is involved in the negotiation. And it is simply expected that if, if the families agree that two, uh, a couple is to be formed by one man, one woman, represented by each family, um, then it is simply assumed that when they're put together and married, um, love will follow. It's expected that love will develop, but, but it's, it's, it's not a, pre a, a process on which the marriage itself is established. It's simply a negotiation among two families and, and a, a very materialistic kind of process that's involved in, in doing that. And the obvious question research-wise is, does it? Does love actually develop in that kind of situation? Um, Usha Gupta and Pushpa Singh um, did a fascinating study in India um, in the early 80s, in which they studied a, a significant number of couples, married couples, um, in, in Jaipur, India, a, a particularly, a reasonably large city uh, in the, the uh, so it's an urban context I'm talking about here, um, in India. Um, and what they did was to compare the amount of love that was expressed by each of the two, man and woman, uh, for each other at three times. One was at the time of marriage, the second one was five years into the marriage, and the third was 10 years into the marriage. So they were asked this, essentially the same uh, question in, in a couple of different ways, but what, what, what is the degree of love that you feel for your partner in this situation? And they gave essentially a, a, um, a love scale to, to um, uh, arranged marriage uh, couples and, and to love marriage couples as, as they were identified in, in, the, uh, in the study. And at the time of marriage, the love marriage couple, the, the kind of Western representative of, of being in love before getting married, um, reported significantly more intense love for one another in that's in, at, at the time of marriage. At both five and 10 year anniversaries, however, five and 10 years into the marriage, the arranged marriage couples responded with more intense love, a rating of a more intense love bond between them uh, than did the, the couples originally based on, on the love-based marriage. So it isn't automatically the case that just because it's an arranged marriage doesn't mean that love won't evolve, won't develop in that kind of a situation. It's just certainly by Western traditions not the way in which we normally expect a marriage to, to, be, um, to, be, to, to be consummated, but, but um, it works. Uh, half the world, more than half the world, uses that kind of an approach in, in one form or another. Which then leads to another fundamental question, several of which we've kind of bounced from to here today, and that has to do with interpersonal attraction overall. The system as a whole is, is, um, is based on the concept of, of interpersonal attraction, and, and a central issue in our study of groups concerns the bases on which we choose to associate ourselves with another individual or a given group, however that may be uh, identified. And it, it can be summarized basically in the quote, we like people who bring us maximum gratification at minimum expense. We like people who bring us maximum gratification at minimum expense. Um, and I'm going to define gratification in three reasonably different ways. One has to do with stimulation. 
The stimulation brought on by new ideas, new activities, new views of particular activities. There are a lot of different ways in which uh, uh, two people coming together may, may be um, uh, mutually stimulating in terms of the ideas and, and the various high points that, that each of them espouses in terms of, of what a hobby should be, what a sports team should be, you know, you name it. Um, but stimulation is one of the things that holds a, a uh, will draw people together. A second thing has to do with the utility value of, of each person in a couple to the other person there. Um, we tend to be drawn toward people who are willing to give their time to us, you know, without any thought about about uh, any kind of either physical or social or emotional uh, reimbursement, it's simply uh, my time is yours. What can I help you with? What are we? What are you doing? And can I help? What's what's the role I can play here? They're essentially resources that are given to you without question, uh, assisting you to get toward whatever your career or, or personal goal happens to be. That's what's meant by, by utility. And thirdly then, the other thing that we look at is, is essentially ego support. And that is sympathy and encouragement or, or, or appreciation and approval. One of the things that draws people together is simply the fact that the other appreciates understands and values what it is that you're doing and is quite free in telling you so. You're doing a valuable service. I appreciate what you do, whether it's volunteering in church or contributing um, to, to uh, you know, the, the local NPR radio station, you name it. Um, but essentially, a valued mate will tend to, to provide ego support for you. They understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and they value it and express it as such to you. They give you support for the kind of things that you yourself have self-selected. It turns out when you look at the overall issue of interpersonal attraction, there are six different factors that, that, uh, that play a role in, in how, we, um, how we are attracted to one another or why we are attracted to one another and, and what leads to that, that actually happening. One of these is, is essentially propinquity. Um, Closeness is another way to say that. I, for some reason, I was just attracted to propinquity as a word. It seems so counter obvious as to what it actually describes there. Uh, I found one ad in, in uh, actually, it was a text that I found it in. Um, but the ad that was uh, in the newspaper read as follows Sensational looking, scintillating, tall, smiling blonde seeks erudite, cultured, sensuous, solvent professional. If that doesn't capture the two things that I talked about earlier, about what men and women are looking for, I can't think of a better example, a better way to do it. Let me read it again so you can hear what was involved. Sensational looking, scintillating, tall, smiling blonde. That person has described kind of the epitome of female attractiveness in the minds of women regarding what men are looking for, and they're probably quite correct in that. Um, and then she concludes it by saying she, as that person, seeks erudite, person who can talk well, cultured, sensuous, solvent, professional. I mean, right away they put themselves up to the PhD or MD level or, or uh, uh, MBA, MBA kind of level there. Um, and in fact, it's right there in terms of, of earning power. That's, that's kind of the number one feature that we were talking about is, as what's involved in, in the two different perspectives. Uh, and you can't have one without the other, but, but it is the case that that, that ad just kind of captures what we're talking about here uh, in, in, in fewer words than I'm able to. Um, it's not possible to become friends or to fall in love with people with anyone um, if you're not in the same general vicinity as, as the, uh, with one another, okay? One of the worst things, if you think about it, one of the worst things that, that happens to high school romance um, or for, for high school romances to survive uh, is graduation. That when the partners of a high school romance um, attend different schools, the relationship is often stressed, particularly if one of the two has been left in high school, that is the other person has moved on to any kind of environment, any kind of other life experience. That is a serious stressor on, on, um, on romantic relationships and the literature is, is quite, quite easily available to, to document that. High school romance is, is not a good predictor of, of lifetime partner 
activities. College romance is much more likely to be the, the, um, the basis ultimately, simply because of being older. And yet we factor that into something we've also talked about here, and that is the, the date of women at first birth nowadays is migrating up into, it's rising steadily. It's up into the mid-30s right now at, at the theoretical medical um, maximum point of, of um, beneficial time to give birth is, is kind of 25 to 35, broadly defined, and we are right at the upper limit of that uh, before marriage is, is often occurring these days. So there are very fundamental shifts occurring in our society here, but, but um, romance is stressed anytime the partners are pulled apart. And let me show you a, a, one of, to me, one of my favorite studies in all of psychology. This was done by Fex, Festinger, Schachter, and Back. Um, back in 1963, and it's become a classic in the field. Um, what was involved here was a study that was actually conducted um, after the Second World War, and that's important because the dorms that were used at, at MIT are, the structure of them is essentially as I've got diagrammed here on the screen, and there were 17 dorms in a complex. And it was a perfect study, and the environment for the study was perfect because the cluster of 17 dorms was actually bound by, uh, it's hard to describe, but, but there is, um, uh, Storo Drive is, is uh, going down the side of the, uh, I can't remember the name of the river, but there's Charles River uh, draining, draining into Boston from Western Mass, uh, and it bends through the city. But there is one place by the MIT campus. MIT is on one side of, of uh, Storo Drive and the river, and Boston proper is on the other side. Uh, and there's one place where the river goes one way and the highway curves around in a different way because of the, the lay of the land. And so there was this area of, of land that was just kind of naturally isolated by the fact that the highway Storrow Drive is a very busy six lane um, route. Into, it's kind of like Westheimer in terms of, of the amount of traffic that it carries here in, in town um, or and in that town in Boston. Um, so essentially those 17 dorms were very effectively isolated. There was not a lot of, of reason to go off or out of the 17 dorm area when, when seeking uh, anybody to interact with and that's exactly what they nailed in, in the study. Um, um, the importance of, of it being having, having been conducted just after World War II is that what they did was to start the study in, in the fall, uh, you know, August, September, as school was actually starting. Um, and they essentially identified, they, they went around to all of the, um, the people involved in, in, the, um, in the dorm complex itself um, with the 17 two-story, 10 apartment buildings. Um, and they asked each of the people involved there who is your best friend? With whom have you spent most of your time? And this was done late August, early September. In other words, right at the beginning of first semester in college for 17 dorms worth of, of incoming freshmen. And the answers, as you might expect in that situation, were literally all over the country. Because MIT is one of those national universities that pulls people in from a lot of different areas, um, being that the, the invitation to join MIT is, is restricted to uh, remarkably high ability people in terms of SAT score and so well you know all that but in any case um, high ability people pretty much a national sample it wasn't that was any one state was overly represented in this group so it was essentially everybody was starting more or less equally in in this uh, study uh, and the question that they started it with as I said was simply who's your best friend where do they live who have you spent most of your time with over the last month and the answers were all over the place and then they simply stood back and watched that is, they came back into the dorms. They made no other attempt to interact with the, with the students that were involved other than that initial question about who's your best friend. Um, and what they did was to come back at the end of the semester, uh, sorry, at the end of the year, end of the, the freshman year toward, you know, the, the surveys being conducted again in, in April and May. Um, again, inquiring, who's your best friend? With whom do you spend most of your time? And the answers were, were stunning in their predictability, I won't say predictability, in their regularity in, in what was, was um, identified there. And so basically what they did was to plot uh, the, the independent variable was essentially one unit for each doorway. So if we look at the dorm uh, on screen, let me show you what's involved here. And that is that, that basically um, this was considered to be one unit, and I'm speaking behind what the slide is actually illustrating there for you. But in essence, what they did, if you start with the bottom left door there, they assumed they tallied one unit if your best friend lived next door. And obviously, two, three, and four units could be accumulated if you lived in the same dorm, same building, 
uh, on the same floor. Four was the maximum distance you could be. And then one extra unit was counted if you had to go upstairs. So although theoretically we're actually working with in, in that particular model, and that's reasonably close to the photograph of what it looks like, um, but if you lived in, in the bottom left um, room um, and your friend was upstairs in, in the upper left room, you were going to have to go one, two, three, three or four units would be tallied in that situation. But it didn't turn out to work that way. It turned out that, that it was very clear uh, when, when you tallied the results that this is what you found. The, the likelihood, or, or well, in fact, let me just describe it in terms of what's, what's identified there. The percent of people who chose someone who were varying degrees of units away is, is almost a linear descending function of how far you have to walk. And it's quite clear in, in this particular graph that about 42% of the best friends, the person with whom you spent most time, were next door neighbors. They were literally right next door, regardless of where you lived in the dorm. Um, the complex, the apartment complex, your best friend was next door for over 40% of the entire sample. And by the time you got to having to live on one end of the dorm and, and walk four doors to get to the other one, it was down to only about 10% of the best friends um, experienced that amount of, of uh, distance. Um, that was within floors, and it turns out you find the same thing not quite as smoothly when you add that fifth unit. That is, if, if, it, if it actually involved changing floors to get from your dorm to the, your room, your apartment to, the, to your best friend's apartment, it was a little more crude when between floors, but the relationship is clearly still there. The closer they were to living where you did, uh, the greater the likelihood that they would be your best friend. So particularly on those friends that are tallied as being on a different floor, um, it worked in, in, uh, as predicted in this situation. Um, so that when residents named their three closest friends in, in this situation, two of them on average lived in the same building and two out of three times they lived on the same floor. Let me give that to you again because that, that's, uh, it's, it's um, beyond what I've shown you on, on the graph here. Uh, and that is that when residents named their three closest friends, two of them on average lived in the same building. That is not more than five units away as we're measuring it there. Um, Two of them lived on, on average on the same building, and two out of three times they lived on the same floor. That is, it was with not five units, but within four units of, of being in the, in the same position. These uh, findings also included um, what could be called functional distance, and, and what, that, what that boiled down to was that those who lived nearest the stairs were selected more often than those who lived in the more remote locations. So if you look at the graph, the, the, the uh, building, what you can see is that the, the people who are most likely to have a um, uh, particular, let's put the building back on the screen, there, uh, sorry, the graph back on the screen. Well, back with it, I'll advance to what I meant to show you, and that is this. If we go back and look at the building, um, in essence, uh, people who live near probably the, the, um, the, the two, the three, let me back up again. The, the three center apartments on any given floor were most likely to be the positions, the residence positions of best friends selected. So if you live near, if you happen to live on a top floor, it was more important to be near the staircase. Uh, and if you were on the top floor and had friends on the bottom floor, it was more likely that they were closer rather than further away from the, from the staircase. So the, the overall consistent finding is quite clear there. And that is the further you have to walk, the lower the likelihood that's where your best friend was going to be. And that's been confirmed in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, the the um, others have, have been able to demonstrate that, that um, the intensity or warmth or depth of a, of a relationship declines with increasing distance on a college campus. The further away a best friend lives, the lower is the, is the uh, intensity of the, the bonding that, that members of that, that uh, duo would, would tend to report to one another in that situation. Another study found that students were more likely to be friends with someone who was eight feet away, that is one door, than someone who was 16 feet away, that is two doors, in a dormitory. Uh, so the, the, the propinquity, the, the closeness, is a major predictor of who we're likely to fall in, in, uh, fall in love with and who we're likely to have as, as best friends. Um, and essentially what we're arguing then is that attraction grows out of proximity. Proximity is a major predictor of who will become your best friend. Um, and the, the question then is, of course, why is proximity so important? And there are several different answers to that question, one of which is availability. 
Um, and that is a, essentially, if you think about it, opportunity is what's involved there. How can you meet people whom you never pass? I mean, it's just propinquity, closeness is really necessary. And what it does is to facilitate availability. Proximity provides that opportunity. Interaction is one of the things on which friendship is based, and that's facilitated by the closeness factor in this situation. Secondly, let's stick with the list while I go through these. Um, secondly, expectation. Expectancy of continued interaction is another basis on which friendship is based, and that's facilitated by that closeness, okay? Uh, a third factor also facilitated by, by closeness is simply predictability. That is, there's a decreased risk and an increased likelihood of reinforcement when you live next to somebody whose behavior you gradually come to understand. That's also facilitated by that closeness. You have a lot of opportunity to, to observe them. Fourthly, uh, there's essentially a mere exposure effect involved here, uh, and that is that, that proximity increases the likelihood of being seen um, in, with by that other individual. One follow-up study on this was fascinating, and that is it involved um, undergraduates, of, uh, students who were, were put into a classroom or walked into a classroom not being enrolled in the class. Women were asked to go to a class none five, 10, or 15 times during the semester. At the end of the semester, photos of the women were put on the screen and each of the students in the class was asked to rate who was most attractive. And lo and behold, the more times they had looked at a given female, the more likely it was that she was viewed as attractive in that situation. That's nothing more than an observation effect. Propinquity is key.